Okay, get started. We can admit everyone. I'm sure. Oh, yeah. Nice. I'll just do it. Hello everybody, uh, thank you for joining today's session. Um, we'll be starting in a moment. So, um, and uh, just for a, just for, for the reference, recording is on since we didn't know the uh, settings for it since Zoom has changed some, some set, some things. So that is why the recording has started from the beginning. So just to make you like, just to make, uh, make everybody feel comfortable. That is why I'm just mentioning it before that. Um, Rachi, uh, can we start or we yeah. need to wait? Okay. Can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see your screen. Um, okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Welcome, uh, welcome to Women Who Code uh, San Francisco Back in Study Group session. Uh, our mission is to empower to excellent technology, empower women to excellent technology careers. Back in study group, learn and discuss back in engineering concepts. Uh, my name is Anjali Pajaj. I am the co host and co host for this session, and I'm working, I am the lead also in, in our San Francisco chapter. Uh, now, over to Prachi, who is the instructor for this session. Uh, so, over to her. Yeah, thanks, Anjali. Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, welcome to another session of Back in Study Group with Women Who Go San Francisco. I'm Prachisha, I'm the instructor and director at Women Who Code SF, and I'm also a senior software engineer working at Unity Technologies. Um, today's session is about DevOps 101. Uh, this is more foundational session. DevOps is a lot of advanced concepts. If you guys are interested in a specific tech or advanced concepts, let us know in the chat and we can uh, plan for a session uh, around those concepts. Uh, today, we are going to cover what are developer operations, uh, some of the basic concepts, and technology stack, which uh, encompasses developer operations. A uh, couple logistics things. Uh, this recording will be available on our backend study group YouTube playlist, which can be found on the Women Who Code uh, channel um, on YouTube. And uh, towards the end of the session, I'll share some resources of, uh, of uh, where you can connect with women who code, you can get more involved with backend study group and also links to uh, future sessions. This presentation is available on GitHub as well. And I'll share a link to that as well. We have all our previous presentations uh, uploaded on GitHub. That's like almost three years of content and uh, YouTube uh, playlist as well. A uh, little bit about backend engineering. This whole group I started a few years ago is where we discuss backend engineering concepts. So it's important to just briefly talk about what backend engineering is. It's a subset of computer science domain um, as a whole. Uh, in backend engineering, we focus on designing, building, and maintaining server side applications. Uh, some of the concepts that we care about in backend engineering. Uh, is client server architecture, networking, APIs, web fundamentals, microservices, databases, security and privacy, operating systems, and so much more. Cloud uh, infrastructure, there's DevOps, there's so much more. Uh, some of the common technology stacks uh, uh, that would be considered backend um, technologies or tools would be uh, very common, right? Like Java, PHP, .NET, C Sharp, uh, that covers like majority frameworks, Ruby, Python, uh, REST for API uh, development, AWS suite, um, uh, Node, SQL, NoSQL, different kinds of databases, SQL, relational and non-relational databases as well. Um, if you look at the diagram, you know, there's a browser, which is a client or the front end, and then behind the scenes, there are web servers, databases, application servers, load balancers, balancers there's a lot going on business logic there's a lot going on behind the scenes that the customer or user never sees really and all that magic is uh, back in engineering today's session is going to be slightly um, it might be slightly heavy or it might be slightly long i'll try to finish it in an hour but uh, consider it as like uh, foundation and also like a template of everything that devops is and if you're just interest in specific technology or topic, you can then do further advanced reading, but this is uh, everything that's foundational to developer operations. 
Um, so DevOps or developer operations uh, merges development and operations teams to shorten the system development or application development lifecycle to produce high quality software and faster. Traditionally, we are, well, these days we have like DevOps teams or ops teams and um, um, development teams and DevOps kind of bridges these teams to work together to uh, push high quality code faster and support uh, rapid application development. So before DevOps developers used to write code and operations, um, they would deploy, they would do everything. And then if things go wrong, it's like a lot of blame games and stuff like that. It did not promote a healthy communication and collaboration. And DevOps also solves this communication collaboration part uh, in engineering. Um, within engineering teams uh, for developers. Uh, what this helps with is a few important things that we achieve when we have developer operations set up is rapid delivery. We can launch new features. We can fix bugs uh, fast. We can cater to customers' needs uh, faster. And, and that way the company, the product, the teams can be competitive, uh, right? Because we are pushing good quality stuff fast than our competitors. So that gives us, us an edge. Uh, improved collaboration, uh, like I said, right? Like uh, develop, uh, development teams and operations team, they kind of hold each other accountable because they work, uh, they collaborate and they communicate. So they hold each other accountable and ensure that everything that is delivered, uh, there is no blame as such because everyone takes shared responsibility. And if the product is good and you get the results and everyone gets a shared credit. Security, one of the bigger things is process or this concepts aims to solve is also security because now developers and DevOps teams, they focus not only just application development, but there's a lot that goes, right? You focus on security, you focus on privacy, you focus on compliance needs, you focus on infrastructure needs, costs, maintenance. There's a lot that uh, goes into application development and maintenance uh, and um, DevOps teams definitely focus on that aspect that developers may or may not fully able to focus on or uh, give time to or priority to sometimes. Uh, a good developer does this by default, but uh, when you work in big teams and big orgs, sometimes uh, developers are kind of loaded with a lot of feature work or bug fixes work or priorities. So then developer teams, developer operations teams come in to support uh, and provide this kind of help. Right, so together these teams can develop uh, and uh, publish uh, high quality code. If you look at the diagram below, the whole it's like a very simplified version of the pipeline between your company, your teams, and customers or the product, and basically plan, monitor, build, test, release, and it's a loop, right? So you build something, you test it, you release, then you monitor the results and how it's accepted by the users. And then you plan again to add more features or fix bugs, right? Uh, fix bugs, right? So it's an iterative process of uh, experimenting, pushing something out there, seeing how it's received, and then planning again and uh, rebuilding or iterating. So this follows somewhat the SGLC model and uh, it, not the waterfall really, but more like an iterative process um, of, the, of software development lifecycle. Uh, if you have any questions, you can put in the chat uh, or you can unmute and ask questions, but I'll be taking those questions towards the end of the session. As, but you feel free to like add comments or questions. Um, one of the important parts of developer operations, so it, there are a lot of concepts that go into developer operations. Uh, this supports the standardization or the process around what DevOps means, or at least how to attain it, how to execute it, right? So some one of the concepts is continuous integration, continuous delivery, I'm, that's called CI-CD. I'm going to break it down into like CI and CD because uh, that term is used um, a lot, but like CI, CD are like very different uh, 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 concepts and they go hand in hand. So uh, if a company says, or if you build up engineering product and you say you follow CI, CD, that kind of makes sense. Uh, so continuous integration is a software development practice where developers merge their code into a central repository. Uh, this is followed by automated testing, building, um, and rebuilding the code, um, helping teams to identify and fix errors more quickly. So one good example is like GitHub, right? Uh, developers push their code on the central repository called GitHub, 
that code is somewhere on the cloud where GitHub stores it, but uh, you can have all your different repositories where you're pushing all your code to those a central repository, right? And it's all published on GitHub. And you can use Git uh, command line technology to you know, manipulate the code. Uh, and then you can, uh, if it's enterprise level, if you're a product or software or your code is enterprise level, then you can have different kinds of integrations within GitHub to with Jenkins or some other pipelines to you know, um, basically build your code automatically build your code, run all the tests, check for security, check for privacy issues, check, check for bad code. Uh, you can do all sorts of security checks and then um, uh, that tells you that your code pushed is high quality and it doesn't break anything and uh, it doesn't cause any security problems or uh, immediate or long-term problems down the line. So depending on your code or product, you want to strengthen the test as well. Like if you're in banking, you probably want to like have really solid amount of tests because when you push code to like a banking product or investment product, you want to make sure everything works fine compared to some other products like Amazon shopping where it doesn't have to be crazy secure, right? It's just manipulating a card, adding or deleting stuff from a card doesn't have to have crazy automated tests. Um, so stuff like that. Uh, I'm oversimplifying here uh, and I'm generalizing here, but again, depending on your product, you can determine what CI you want to um, implement and uh, what kind of automated tests you want to add as well. The idea here is every time you push a code uh, to one of these repositories, Git or um, 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 uh, Bitbucket, any tool you use, it triggers an automatic pipeline build and all that does is runs your code and runs your tests and make sure that the changes you push uh, do not break anything and they do not cause any problems in the system. Uh, so that is what continuous integration is. Um, some of the things we uh, we do in continuous in integration is we put, we put frequent code changes. So we'll push code frequently to this repository. We'll merge code. We can have different branches uh, of the code. There's a whole concept of Git flow and a branch of the code where um, there's a main branch where the actual production level high quality code is. But if developers in different teams are experimenting, they can create a branch of their own, which is just a copy of the main production level repository uh, and uh, literally copy of the code. And then you can just manipulate that. And if everything looks good, then you can try to merge it to your main production level code, which is what you see live, right? Which is what customers will see. So stuff like that. Uh, automated testing, I already mentioned that, right? When you put stuff on GitHub or uh, Bitbucket, you can integrate with Jenkins and other pipeline uh, providers to run automated tests. That way, me as a developer, I don't have to run all the tests locally all the time. Uh, some applications I've worked on, they have had like thousands of uh, lines of code. If I run all that code and all those tests locally, my app, my computer might just like, you know, like it will just like error out. So I can't even do that because my computer or my laptop doesn't have all the resources to do that because the code is huge. So I will make sure that the piece of code that I am touching in the application of the project, I may, I'm going to make sure that I add tests and don't break anything. And then I push my code and rely on the automated test to ensure that the, all the code runs. And this is GitHub's resources. So they have all the resources to run tests um, faster than running in my laptop. So I'm relying on these kind of automated build jobs or uh, pipelines for testing, um, for sure. Uh, developers QA they rely on, on this process. Uh, immediate feedback, like I said, right? If your build job fails, if some test fails, you get immediate feedback that something is wrong with your code, right? Either you broke something or you missed something, or there was some other change made in the repo which you didn't know about. You need to accommodate that. Uh, so you need to update your code. Stuff like that. There are a lot of things that can happen, but these are some common examples. Uh, build automation, right? Like you can automate this whole build process as well. So you have all the freedom of all the things you want to run. You just want to run tests, fine. You want to run security checks, fine. You want to run security checks and create a report. Every time someone pushes a code, fine. You can do that too. So there is like a lot of tools available uh, for a CI uh, process. And consistency, right? You have this whole process where um, CI ensures that if anybody who makes changes to the code, they follow the same process. It can all be tracked and it can be reverted as well. And uh, this way you ensure that the code remains stable. Only good quality code uh, gets deployed in production. Uh, anything else uh, will be reviewed and not pushed. Um, some of the version control systems, uh, uh, some of the tools in CI we use are version control systems like Git, GitHub, uh, Bitbucket, Stash, 
uh, bridge servers can be Jenkins CI pipeline, uh, for example, that uh, can be run to automate builds and, and even automate tests. And there are like proper settings you can do. These uh, tools are like quite customizable. So you can add right from resources to what piece of code you want to run in a project, what to ignore, what files to ignore, um, what security checks to do, all of that. Developers can do it themselves. And if there's a de developer operations team, they can do this as well. And this is where developers and DevOps teams work together. The developers can say, hey, this is the piece of code I'm pushing and these are the tests that need to run. Uh, okay, and developer operations can be like, okay, I'm fixing the build to make sure that uh, the, the, this new code, these new tests are run and everything Everything works as expected. So this is where that whole collaboration uh, process within teams and for these kind of technologies uh, really works. Some of the examples would be like open source projects, right? Like people are pushing code, these getting reviewed, and then if, if, the, if the community approves it or key moderators approve it, then you can push the code, right? That's continuous integration. Uh, E-commerce platforms, mobile apps, basically any place where you're pushing code and it's being reviewed and goes through like this automated checks and uses these kind of tools, it's all uh, uh, continuous integration. And, and Today, continuous integration is used pretty much by every technology uh, technology in this uh, in the technology industry by every company. Uh, if you have every company is becoming a technology company uh, more or less, and everyone's doing continuous integration at this point. Uh, Git is quite old. Jenkins is like also like uh, quite old in technology. Like people are familiar um, for sure. Workflow is uh, quite simple. You develop some code on your local laptop or computer, you commit it, that means you push some code to the re remote repository. Uh, then there is this build CI, which is uh, your build jobs, which automatically run different processes, different tests, different security checks. If you need a report of it, you can generate reports. Otherwise, in the browser UI and GitHub, if you see, if you create a pull request and you have a build job, you can see that, hey, all these 10 tests passed, but all these five tests failed. And this is exactly why they failed, right? So you can debug right there. Uh, so it's quite visible. And then fix, right, all the required. Because you get hints and you understand why it's failing, uh, you can use that knowledge uh, for debugging and fixing the changes. And then the whole process continues. Right, so once your report is clear, it's green, no more issues, then you can be, developers can be confident about their code. Then you want to make sure that you deploy in some environment, test it with your front end or whatever your product is. That's product level UX, working with front end kind of texting. Uh, but this is, every developer, this is like basics. Right, Push, pushing some, C, having a CI workflow and pushing your code, this is how all of us push our code to production. So this is like quite foundational and, and very common. Uh, like I said, right, benefits are rapid feedback, reduced bugs because automated tests help you identify bugs that you might have missed, um, which is fine. Uh, enhanced collaboration, like, you know, if something with a build job or doesn't work, then you can always reach out to your DevOps team. They'll help you with the support, with the development. And you can, that way you, everyone has a shared responsibility and you get more help. Developers get more help to get um, um, operation side or tooling uh, to work properly for their development and testing. Um, and time efficiency, right? Like I don't have to you run all those hundred tests locally. My machine might not even like support that because of resource uh, limitations. But if I run a build job and I, if I create a build job or the DevOps teams creates a build job with tests because the resources on those machines is quite um, efficient, it may take like 20 minutes to run all the 100 tests. And that saves me a lot of time. And I can push code multiple times a day and test it out and make sure that you know everything is fine. So it reduces time. And that's something that's really important uh, in, in application development. Um, there are some challenges when you try to do uh, CI, like you have to understand the tooling. You have to understand the process. Like you have to work with your engineering teams to make sure that they follow this process. Right, so that's one thing. Other is understanding tooling, like how GitHub integration works, how Jenkins pipelines work, what kind of resourcing do you want to do, what kind of how many number of um, remote servers you want to even assign to your project uh, to run uh, the test. Right, like if your project is used by an internal one three person team internally, you might assign one server. But if your project is live and uh, it's 
being used by thousands of customers, you might want to allocate like 100 servers, right? Like, so resourcing also kind of matters. So you need to understand a lot of these things. That's where develop, uh, op developer operations teams really help uh, as well. Uh, maintaining test suites, right? More tests, fixing old tests, all of that is very, very, very important. And cultural shift, right? Like we didn't have CI, CI, CD like decades ago, right? Like you need to understand that you need to follow this workflow. These are the benefits. These are the challenges. And we want to move towards um, an engine team culture uh, where we follow this process because uh, it automates a bunch of things, it simplifies processes, and everyone gets shared credit, but also the blame is kind of shared. And there are a lot of people that help out to fix things. And this way, uh, engineers and DevOps teams get to learn these products and these technology stacks. So, um, it can be initially like a mentality issue, but uh, these days all companies are doing CI for sure. Continuous delivery is the second half of CI CD. Uh, this is where, uh, this is an approach where like software is developed, tested and released in short cycles to ensure that it can be re reliably deployed at any time. Uh, here the idea is that, you know, you want to have quicker, more frequent releases. Uh, and focus on automation and collaboration. So here you want to speed up the pace, right? Now you have a process. Now you want to speed up the pace. Uh, you want to do more frequent deliveries. You want to automate a few things that, uh, like if I can write a script uh, to automate a process where compared to like me actually manually doing something, then I would want to go for it, right? That's a very simple example. Um, the idea here is you want to automate as much as you can, uh, right? We don't want to waste uh, valuable developer time where they are manually doing stuff, if it can be automated, even if you want to use a new technology or new language, learn it, do it, right? So we want to minimize errors as well, the human errors, especially, right? So we want to automate building, testing, releases. Um, in, in big companies, usually at any company at this point, you know, we push code in releases. Um, there's a whole release flow around, the, like there's a whole workflow as what release looks like. I don't want to get, get into that, but you want to release, right? We want to push code and every significant code that's pushed or feature that's pushed, we call it a release. Uh, this way it helps us understand, you know, what was, what features were deployed first, then next, and how we iterate and stuff like that over a span of time. Uh, we want to, this helps us collaborate across teams, right? Which is kind of like um, the whole um, benefit of DevOps uh, anyway. Uh, you maintain a repository, you can push code faster and you can have different releases, which can have different versions of the same code uh, that can help developers to experiment, test things out, make changes. So you can have different versions of the same code and, and you have the full freedom to experiment, manipulate, make changes, test, test those, uh, versions out and they can all contribute to different releases as well uh, like for example um, uh, I have a product I have a I have an app right it's a travel app uh, right if uh, uh, because of the limitation it's a mobile app let's say and because of the limitations of an iOS version on an iPhone versus like an Android version on um, Android mobile phone I might have two different versions of the same uh, product or the same code right because the version system the, uh, the operating system for these two phones is different and there might be some very important changes that might make or break my um, mobile app right so i would have two versions of the same travel app one is for ios and one is for android and i might call them different versions uh, number wise or name wise as well and it uh, those different versions respect the underlying operating system right so and even the technology so stuff like that that helps me so whenever i push new code i'm pushing two releases one for ios one for android uh, if I have a website, then that would be different, right? So stuff like that, you can uh, have different releases and different versioning as well. Uh, stable test environment, that is the whole idea as well. Like uh, whenever developers push code, uh, they want to have like a stable environment and tests run because uh, there are some very complicated applications. Uh, like if you're writing a, a portfolio management software, it's very complicated because it has a business logic and mathematics around what is the portfolio adding a stock to portfolio means what is rebalancing means what the selling means so there's a lot of business logic going on and when you push any code you want to make sure that you're not breaking that business logic because if you break that then like your software is actually not working like the portfolio is not managed so that is a really big blunder like you might be messing with customers money uh, and that is really bad so like we want to automate common tests as much as 
we can. So we have more confidence in the changes we push and we have more confidence in the product that it, we should not be breaking things that were working, that are expected, unless we are doing some change, then even then it should be very contained and scoped out. So it gives everyone more confidence and reduces errors as well. Uh, consistency and repeat repeatability, right? Like I treat this process. We are now moving towards a quicker, faster, frequent releases, automating as much as we can. And we just want to like continue, right? Um, some of the components of this would be version control, which you already um, looked into. Continuous integration, of course, automated testing, automated deployments where uh, you can you can have different environments, like a production environment, a QA environment, a staging environment, a developer environment, depending on your product and your team resources and uh, a lot of other things. You might have different deployment uh, environments and you can automate deployment to those environments as well. Um, um, this kind of like relates to infrastructure as a code uh, as well, where your infrastructure or your tools, they are automated and um, you can code around these tools as well, but this kind of aligns with the infrastructure as a code where the underlying foundation is uh, CI, CD. CI, CD also has a pipeline or a workflow where you build something, right? That's combining your code, packaging your code into an artifact. Then you run code against that for quality assurance, right? Um, or QA, then you deploy, you automate the deployment of that code to different environments, be it QA, be it staging, be it production, which is live. And then you release, you can have control over all the releases that you want for that same uh, product. It can have different code. The code bases can be slightly different and the releases can be different. And you have full control over all of this uh, because of the tools and the automation that uh, you have uh, created. So many benefits, right? Like rapid releases, lower risk, fewer bugs, uh, high quality, more confidence in your code and your releases, uh, enhance productivity, right? Because of automation and improve customer satisfaction, right? Like uh, the sooner you push changes, the sooner you fix bugs, your customers gonna love your mobile app or your website, right? So like uh, down the line, your customers are happy because they see changes fast. They see that the product is getting mature uh, because of bug fixes and stuff like that. So you can get more customers to sign or more cus uh, customers retain uh, your own retention. Uh, challenges are implementation. So like, because you're using so much tooling, so much automation, it costs really add up fast like uh, some of these tools are like really expensive and they sell to enterprise and cloud technologies are very expensive so all companies the biggest problem they have operations wise is the cost and there is always a concern there is always a problem to accommodate like any ask any engineer like if you have an opportunity to just cut cost or save cost like you want to look into that and ideally even prioritize that so uh cost and tool setup like you're automating stuff but you might need to learn a new language or new tool and understand the software licensing and the cost and the resourcing around it like that that has like a big learning curve and developer operations teams really take a lot of this burden uh but uh, depending on what the engineering team is or developers are working on they might also like very heavily share this burden and they might also need to know uh, a lot about these kind of uh, tooling costs and and all sorts of even like in some of the things I worked in the past, like I had to understand even the architect core architecture of a certain technology or tool I was using to even understand like why are we using this, what are the benefits we can get from it because we are I'm looking into the underlying core architecture of how this technology is created. So it really matters uh, uh, as a developer. A uh, cultural shift, all this like you know like. You need to collaborate, you need to use these tools, you need to rely on automated tests, you need to automate everything, uh, you need to have different releases, you might need to have different production environments. Now, this is like a team effort, like everyone needs to be on board. It's okay to not have some of these things, but if you're looking into CD, this is foundational. Now you can pick and choose and customize what works best. You don't have to have four in deployment environments. You can have like dev and production, and that is fine too. Uh, ideally, people have dev, QA, and production, right? But um, QA, I think, is important. Let's not skip it. But as an example, right, like uh, all this can be customized. So these are recommendations or best practices or foundational to developer operations. And then uh, engine teams, depending on their time, resources, costs, uh, requirements, bunch of other things, can pick and choose and customize.
um, as well. And skill requirement, like I said, right? Like you need to know, be aware of like these principles. You need to be aware of these tools. Uh, you know, you need to understand what the integration, is it an integration in your code or is it something as simple as go on a website, buy a product, pay the amount and everything is happening on their website. That might be simpler, faster, but if there's a code integration, like I need to call GitHub's API from my code uh, right now, do I know how to do that? Like, what does that API cost? What is the security around it, right? Like, do I need to store some data? What does their error handling look like? Like, okay, now there is like a big learning curve around like even integrating with one tool in their APIs, if that is the approach you take, right? Can I use certain tools by command line or I need like a software or I can go on a website, uh, you know, with GitHub, you have all these options. I prefer command line the best uh, and then the website, but like someone might prefer like a software to do it. They need a GUI. So you need to now understand how the GUI works uh, and understand the core principles of Git to even like manipulate your code, right? So Git itself, uh, there are commands, all sorts of commands that you need to understand. So learning curve is huge and that is where the whole mindset, mentality, learning curve all kind of adds up, uh, adds the, uh, can add a little bit of complexity. Next uh, concept uh, for us is cloud computing. Uh, folks know about cloud computing at this point, like it's for uh, delivery of computing services such as storage, TV, software over the internet, right? So you don't store anything on prem. You have all this. Um, servers um, store or data centers store somewhere else, physical machines somewhere else. That's where your application, your data, your services, everything is stored and you just pay the premium for um, all the rent, I guess, for that storage and uh, um, management. Uh, some of the characteristics are like, you know, on-demand sales service. These, a uh, lot of stuff is automated and taken care of behind the scenes by these cloud uh, providers or by these uh, applications on the cloud and they take care of a lot of work for you. All you need to do is understand their APIs or their uh, GUI or, or their features and you're good to go. Uh, broad network access, right? Like uh, depending on how complete your application, your software is or your company is, you might deal with a lot of different like underlying technologies like your operating systems, your network protocols, lots of stuff. And they take care of all of that headache for you. So you just need to pick a tool that works for you and, and not worry about anything. So everything is behind the scenes and taken care of. This is very foundational, low level um, uh, computer science stuff, right? Like protocols, uh, APIs, um, all sorts of stuff that the resource allocation, uh, all sorts of stuff they, uh, these uh, providers take care of. Resource pooling, right? Like if your application is running at a peak time, they might allocate more resources, servers, the database server, application server, whatever, load balance or whatever to manage that load, right? So they take care of all of their auto scaling and all of those requirements, resource management requirements for you. Uh, it may come at a cost, or uh, some kind of settings that you might want to do, uh, but that is something you negotiate, right? And, and these uh, providers, they take care of it. I already mentioned that, right? Rapid elasticity, so you can automate a scaling, uh, downscaling or upscaling, or a scaling of resources. Um, it can be as simple as RAM, or it can be as simple as hard drive space, or it can be as simple as like, uh, as complete application servers. Um, Measure service, so yeah, same, like the resource optimization. Yeah. Resource optimization here would be like if your application is assigned five servers to run at a particular time, but it's only utilizing three servers, then you downscale, right? Like it will be smart enough to not allocate you five anymore, you don't want to allocate you three and free of the resources. So these systems are quite smart and efficient and they automated, they have automated all of this. Uh, so there are three different kinds, uh, different models. Right, infrastructure as a service, which is more uh, at the network IT resource uh, level, like your AWS takes care of this, GCP takes care of this. Platform as a service, which is more focused on like uh, uh, applications, application management, uh, or I would say more like platform or actually more like platform or framework management. Uh, basically, platform and frameworks takes care of uh, a lot of your uh, basic needs and automation. So things are uh, 
already created for you, taken care of, and then you can just build your software on top of it. A very common functionality. So Heroku, Google App Engine are good examples. And software as a service is like um, your basic application or mobile app or software that can be accessed over the internet for your customers or users. And let's say Gmail, Zoom, any any service that's connected to the internet um, basically is at this point a SaaS. Um, deployment models, there are different kind of deployment models to keep in mind too. This is likely, uh, if you guys are interested, like let me know in the chat, like this is like, I'm oversimplifying here in the interest of time. And because this is a foundational session, like these are like very like uh, intense, topics and very interesting so if you're interested like let me in the chat and i can create a whole session around this uh, there are different kind of like deployment models in and around this cloud computing technologies or cloud technologies where we look there are three, three different kind of clouds one is public cloud which is open to anyone services offered over like your public internet the other is private which is something which is like cloud architecture or cloud platform but it's only um, used within your um, organization so it's private like it cannot be accessed by everyone and hybrid which is a mix of public and private where you have a cloud architecture architecture or a tool uh, some of these things are public and the rest of the features are uh, private so like these kind of options are available this is more related to like access and permissions uh, but like cloud providers have given these options uh, for teams uh, and developers to kind of like uh, have more uh, customization on how they can use the technologies and the features. Um, the advantages, right? Like cost of cost efficient. Um, this is cost efficient because compared to on-prem traditional infrastructure, cloud is slightly cheaper and less headache to maintain. But depending on your product, these eventually costs can go quite high. Uh, so you have to be very careful. Cost is always uh, something to keep in mind. But compared to traditional uh, infrastructure, definitely it's an upgrade. Uh, scalability, right? Like these providers to softwares, they take care of your resource needs. They take care of your data needs. They can do backup, uh, restoration. They can do versioning. So they can also like manipulate your data in a more intelligent way that developers necessarily don't need to. So a lot of great features. Automatic updates, right? If they come up with any infrastructure updates or any new features, you are getting it because you are subscribed or you use that tool, right? So you automatically get all the new benefits. Remote access, right? Like you can go anywhere and access your website or your tool, right? Because it's all on the cloud. All you need is like internet and you have to understand the access. Uh, so uh, on-prem is like you have like a couple of three or four servers in your office. Like you need to be connected to your office network or something like that to make sure that you have all the access and you can do things. It might not always be the case uh, with like, with cloud, you don't have to worry. Like on-prem has its limitations. Challenges, security, right? Like you, you rely on these systems with your data and your application. If there is a hack or if, they, if their, their company introduces a security um, uh, 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 problem, like, your your application or your company is automatically vulnerable, right? So like it can be uh, quite dangerous, like the level of trust you have. So uh, those kind of things, uh, you know, you have to like uh, always keep in mind. Um, compliance, like because you are trusting these applications with uh, uh, your uh, data and your resources, you might want to like uh, uh, understand what the compliance needs are right what the data protection laws are what the application protection laws are and uh, you need to have the like, agreements with these providers like hey like what happens if my data changes or my da data is breached or my software is stolen like what how do you deal with it what are the legal requirements as well right so who is the point of contact so all of these things need to be completely like discussed uh, it would be in the contract as well. Downtime, like what if their system is down? Now your application or your data is down. You can't even access it. What does that look like? Right, their servers failed or they had some security issue and they shut down for a day. Like how would you, uh, if you are all your data and your software is completely on the cloud uh, and if they shut down for whatever reason, even if it's for five minutes and your application is live, now your customers couldn't access your application or data for five minutes. Does that mean nothing happened or does it mean you lost hundreds and thousands of dollars in five minutes, right? Like, 
what does that look like? Now you need to talk about those things, right? What does a service inter, uh, interruption look like and how to deal with it? Right, like they, they, the provider might tell you, we guarantee you, we will never have a downtime of uh, more than five minutes. Well, okay, great. Then we need to accommodate for that five minutes when we develop our software and our systems. And if they break that contract or that uh, agreement, then uh, is there a legal repercussion or is there a financial repercussion? We don't know. So these are the things like the business side or operation side of companies will think about, but these are the things to, to understand. And limited control over data and services, right? Like um, you as a developer, as an engineer, can build all sorts of functionalities with your data and with your service. But if you're putting your code on a provider, uh, they might only have five features, right? Uh, you might like to have more. You build something on your own within your application or you ask them to provide you five more features, right? Like you are somewhat limited to what functionalities and features you get. And you have to understand their language or how they see data and services. And that is something part of learning or anyway. So it can be it can be limited or it can be like uh, uh, kind of scoped out, like what those services are, what the jargon is, what their functionalities, how is data viewed in their system versus how you see data as an engineer within your company or team, right? So uh, it can be different by the way, right? So like you need to understand that, like you need to completely understand what you're getting into. And these are some of the things that are like, like all of this is foundation. If you're in an engineer, if you're in a DevOps team, like you are looking into this already. And then you work with different teams or different um, um, point of person to kind of like formalize all this. Uh, but this is basics that you need to think about. Infrastructure as a code, uh, it's, it's a very important practice where we manage and uh, manage the provision of like computing resources, right? Via machine readable scripts uh, rather than manual configuration. So here we want to automate a lot of infrastructure needs, right? Like uh, it can be automation, it can be uh, policies as a code, it can be monitoring. All of these things that are part of like software engineering or core application development, you want to uh, automate and make it configurable as much as possible. Uh, you know, some of the examples would be like, okay, we want to have like configuration files that can help us uh, uh, customize our application, right? Or settings or different states, right? You want to have like automated tools like Terraform or CloudFormation Ansible that will help you test your application or build your ad, uh, application in different ways. Uh, right, uh, you might want to use um, technologies for containerization. Uh, this is more like resource level um, uh, work, but like this is providing you customization and automation, all different levels of software development uh, and maintenance and monitoring. Uh, right, some of the core principles again are source control, which we looked at, versioning. Right, different versions of code can be rolled back or, or, or released. Uh, modularity, uh, you know, like the idea is that the code is reusable and modular. So this helps you kind of like scope out your code and, uh, um, and your application and have more control over how that code will behave. And again, CI, right? Like obviously CI, CD uh, becomes a, a foundation here. So infrastructure side, you want to automate as much as you can. And uh, you want to customize, also ensure that your applications, your systems are customizable or configurable, uh, depending on your product needs or your engineering needs or any kind of uh, uh, requirements that you have. You want to be able to customize it on the fly. Um, so one example would be like in production, you want to use like real data, but in dev or QA environment, you want to use fake data, right? So you should be able to customize all of this, right? You might have some kind of configuration around like databases. If it's a QA environment or dev environment, use some kind of fake data to uh, test your application, right? Don't use real customer data, uh, right? Because then it might be banking information or someone's credit card information. You don't want to access that. Like that's like actually compliance issue. So you might use fake credit card numbers or fake names to test your data, right? Um, if it's a banking application, for example. But in production, you have real data and you don't necessarily, as a developer, should have access to it uh, because it's someone else's information and it's like PII. It can be PII. So uh, this is legal compliance issue. So like it's very different. Uh, so these kind of things you can uh, customize or automate uh, as well. Um, that's the idea. Uh, advantages, again, right? Consistency, standardization of application development, uh, repeatability, provisioning, all of that. 
scalability, right? Like uh, scalability is kind of a big benefit of DevOps in general and all these technologies in general. Accountability, right? Like uh, you can track your changes, you can audit them easily, uh, compare different releases or different versioning of the code. So um, really helps developers be have more confidence in the code they're pushing and uh, manage it down the line. Uh, and manual effort, right? Like I can spend five hours manually doing something in Excel, but if someone gives me a script or some tech company has built a tool around automating that and it takes me like 10 minutes, it's like great, right? Like, thank you. Like, I would rather go for automation. So 100%. Um, so that is the idea as well. Um, steps, uh, implementing steps are simple. You define what your infrastructure requirements are, depending on your code, your product, your engineering needs, your costs right, all of that. And then you have some kind of version control uh, for storing your code. Uh, you have, you can do automations. Uh, it can be scripting, it can be tools, uh, anything. It can be process automation, it can be code automation, everything counts. And then you monitor your infrastructure, right? Like uh, if you're using AWS or GCP, uh, you should be able to monitor your code, you should be able to monitor your data and see how everything is going. Right, and then you should be able to maintain. The whole idea is you build something and then you can customize it, you can automate it, and you can maintain. Like we build so we can maintain properly, right? So like maintenance can be a nightmare if you don't build correctly, right? So you have to think far ahead. Uh, and these kind of processes and improvements uh, and DevOps definitely helps you be uh, a long-term player, right? Like you have good quality stuff that lasts. Uh, because if you're pushing, changing things every year, it's like very expensive and it's hard to keep up. Like, what are you changing? Why? And people might not remember or understand. So you want to build to last longer. Uh, some of the tools like Terraform is used for data center infrastructure management. Ansible is an automation tool. AWS is cloud formation. AWS is a lot of uh, technologies. So like, you know, they take care of a lot of uh, infrastructure. IAS, PaaS, SaaS, um, um, automations and customizations. Uh, use cases, anything, right? Environment setup, like I said, uh, the database uh, might store fake data when it comes to QA or dev, but if it's production, the database is storing like real customer data, right? So this is like different environment setups. Environments here is production, QA, uh, or testing and development, right? So those kind of things, auto scaling, right? Like uh, during holiday season, Walmart needs to auto scale because they need more servers because everyone's online on Walmart shopping. But uh, like uh, end of February, it's not holiday season. So you don't need so many people online so they can reduce their use of uh, resources to manage that load because the reduced load compared to holiday season, for example. And disaster recovery, right? Like uh, internet is down or some security issue happened or some server somewhere failed, right? Like how do you deal with that? Like these systems will take care of those problems for you. Uh, and those are really big uh, infrastructure problems uh, that uh, um, are solved. And that is what you pay for when you want to have these kind of like cloud computing and all these other technologies that they take care of all of this for you. So you don't have to build it yourself, uh, right? Orchestration is a very important concept in DevOps. Uh, it is basically automated coordinated management of tasks to optimize and streamline IT processes and workflows, primarily in uh, software development and deployment. So what you want to do here is you want to optimize and streamline uh, your processes for efficiency of your applications and reduced errors. Uh, you want to automate your workflows. So like, how do we do code deployment? How do we take care of databases, right? Like, do you have a schema change? Are you upgrading to a newer version of MySQL, right? Like, uh, are we moving from SQL to NoSQL? Um, whatever, like, you know, those kind of things you want to understand what the workflow is. If you can automate some of those things, uh, that would be great. Network configurations, right? Like, this is very foundational, but you need to worry about network protocols, configuration, resource management, underlying operating systems, uh, all of that. Uh, manage execution, right? Like ensure task follow specific. So this is around like policies and processes uh, and managing dependencies, right? So uh, orchestration, again, helps you customize part of infrastructure, but the goal is to specifically achieve these kind of um, uh, benefits, right? Like you have automated workflows around like uh, your infrastructure, like your deployment process, your database management, network management, server management. Uh, you want to 
these concepts are quite exhaustive and complicated when you work on like big big uh, applications and big products um uh, and that's when you will see the real magic of like what devops is um orchestration there are like different kinds uh, or applications one is the deployment orchestration right like uh, everything in your deployment flow from like i'm writing a code in my laptop right now and tomorrow it's live on website on amazon.com like like how did that happen right like what is the workflow what is the flow of my code from my laptop to the repository to production right like i that is my deployment workflow and i want to orchestrate as much as i can in that workflow other is containers right like uh, you have there's this concept of like containers and you can manage those containers where you can have like your code on instances and pods and clusters. There's a whole different uh, field around like uh, what containers are and orchestration. And you can manage that lifestyle as well. This is more for testing, but it's also applied to, to production where you can have your code in containers. Workflow like uh, workflow is around like processes and, uh, and tools that you use and uh, any automations you can do there. And cloud, if you're using cloud services, then what does that, what does utilization of cloud applications looks like, right? Like um, we might have our code in on-prem, um, application code in like on-prem server, or, or we might be using like GCP for some kind of code storage, but we might be storing our data on AWS, right? Like now we are dealing with, it's very bad idea, but now we are dealing with like different technologies, like what does the workflow look like? Uh, what does the flow of data and code or business logic look like, right? Like you will need to understand this. Um, stuff like that. If the company is big, you might use different providers. So it can get complicated. If the company is small, team is small, you might stick to GCP only or AWS only or Azure only. Uh, that's when it might not uh, be too tedious of a process. Like uh, there are some tools that already do this for you. Uh, Kubernetes does it when it comes to containerization. Ansible does it, right? IT automation. Terraform does it. Apache Airflow uh, focuses on like data warehouse and data lakes, so it takes care of like data management, ETL processes, all of that um, is Airflow and and that domain. So a lot of orchestration, automation, uh, workflow management is what's happening here. The goal is to like uh, be more efficient and reduce errors in, in these processes, which uh, become quite important and which are kind of normal uh, in, in any company at this point. Um, one thing to also remember, anything you build, uh, you need to monitor, right? Like, how do I know what I build works? How do I know there are no errors? How do I know there is no hacker trying to break my thing, right? Like, you need to monitor what you're putting out there, right? Like monitoring, logging, debugging, very important. So application monitoring focuses on like a lot of different things. Uh, key things here, the key idea is to ensure that whatever you're putting out there, your code, your product, your system, your application uh, works uh, optimally, is efficient, and uh, it uh, ensures that uh, users get what they paid for right so some of the key concepts would be like performance monitoring like you want to make sure that you push a piece of code and it does not it's not it's so uh, uh, it's con consuming for example so many resources that your application server just like uh, shut down for whatever reason right because it doesn't have resources right like you don't want to push code that is like not even performing well you created a new api and you put it out there in production now your uh, end users are using it but that api is taking like uh, three minutes to load that is terrible, terrible API design. Uh, right, you don't want to do that like barely three seconds. Like that's a lot too. So right, like you want to make sure that your API is performance. You need to monitor that, right, uh, during peak hours, non-peak hours. So stuff like that, as an example, errors, right? Like you want to make sure there are no application level errors, no infrastructure level errors. If there are any errors in the business logic, they are logged. So you can review and understand like, I would want to see, right? Like I added a new feature and I added a new log message. I want to see how many times this piece of code has been run and uh, the number of log messages in that piece of code will tell me, uh, you know, like what is going on, stuff like that. Logging itself is like a big field. Uh, there are different tools and different best practices around logging as well. User experience, right? Like you want to see how your users are engaged with your website or your app and stuff like that. You can monitor their experience as well. And resource utilization, like I mentioned before, right? You want to make sure that your code or your product does not use, utilize all the resources uh, that is allocated. It needs to be efficient. 
uh, not only performant, but also efficient when it comes to resource uh, resourcing. And uh, all these things need to be monitored. This is like a small list, but there is a lot like, like stuff like metrics, right? You need to make sure what is your API response times or error rates or your throughput or your latency. Uh, when you are pushing and deploying a code at scale, all these things make such a difference. Uh, right, like it's like everything that you need to have, like you need to ensure proper latency, proper throughput, reduced to no error rate, uh, really high response time. Uh, these things matter a lot and engineers uh, spend a lot of time improving these core functionalities. All right, you want to push something out there, but you're, if you're, you should already be addressing this when you build, when you architect, when you design, uh, when you're developing, but after you put something out there and you see how your product is behaving, how your users are uh, using your product or your APIs and stuff like that, you and the data you get, you want to get better at these things, right? So this is iterative process. Alerts, right? Like if something is wrong or something goes off, you need to, you need to have an alerting system in place that will uh, notify the correct people to look at the issues and, and to do something about uh, those alerts. And there's a whole process of work on that as well. Data visualization, right? All these dashboards and technologies are there, which will help you see your data in charts, um, error rates, all of that log messages, you can see everything. Um, some of the approaches would be real time, right? Some others would be like some kind of alerting or pods. And then you can also have like reports. Right, which is more delayed. So there are different ways of monitoring uh, applications. Benefits, like I said, right, higher user satisfaction, uh, better approach to like uh, issue resolution. You can monitor and then therefore optimize performance. And you see all this data, right? How your application is performing. So all the decisions you make after that are fully data driven, and therefore it's informed. Uh, challenges are complexity, like uh, if your data grows. What all are you monitoring? Do you need to monitor everything? Or you can only monitor a few key things. Yeah, because if I'm like in this example, right, I'm using like a monitoring tool. Like I'm monitoring like nine charts here, but that costs me like a lot. Can I just monitor three charts? And that's enough for me, right? Then that might cost me less, right? So now you need to think about all of that. Like, is it too much? Uh, what all do you need to monitor and what not? Um, and then tool management, right? Like I now I need to understand their charts. I need to understand this tool and uh, what does it even mean, right? Like uh, alert fatigue, right? Like another thing is alert fatigue. Like if you're getting too many alerts, too many problems with your application, now it's like, now you need to deal with it, right? Like change your alerting process, improve your application. So, you know, it works smoothly as expected. So stuff like that, all applications, e-commerce application, mobile applications, cloud, everything, all applications these days have some kind of alerting and monitoring in place. And Datadog, New Relic, uh, SolarWinds, these are very famous um, applications that help you monitor different, if not all parts of your application, databases like APIs, bunch of different things. Um, logging goes hand in hand. You can additionally also log different kinds of stuff in your application or software. You can have system level logs. You can have uh, logs around like troubleshooting issues, bugs. You can log your compliance, audit security trails. You can log the behavior of the like the flow of the business logic or the user experience. You can log like system performance matrices. You can do all of that within the code or using systems or tools, right? So logging helps you get a trail uh, of like, what is actually going on in your application, in your data in real time. And it gives you kind of a history of what is going on uh, from like you push your code to like today, right? Like monitoring will help you see the status of your application, the health or status of your applications, but logging will help you give uh, a history, an audit trail that you can uh, you can look at the history and the flow and the uh, and the status change to help you make better decisions or debug an issue or just uh, use that data for analytics for the improvements right uh, you can create all sorts of charts around on those kind of things as well some of the very common um, i guess benefits of uh, logging are error detection right like something happened yesterday in my application that caused all sorts of errors that i have been seeing today now i it, because i have a log 
I have a history and I can see what happened exactly at 5 p.m. yesterday that I started to see all the errors, right? So now I, I can only, uh, before that, everything was fine, let's say, after 5 p.m., something happened and what happened, right? I can like have a more focus, error detection and identify issue identification and resolution. Therefore, security, right? Like all kinds of security breaches, vulnerabilities that you can proactively try to log and identify. Uh, compliance, right? Like a lot of these things you need to do for compliance reasons because every company these days has deals with like customer data. So it can become very sensitive. So you need to have like all sorts of legal compliance, software compliance, uh, um, uh, all sorts of regulatory uh, um, re legal requirements in place. And some of the things we do is also for compliance reasons, not just like good engineering practices and performance analysis, right? Like performance is everything uh, and user experience is everything. So we want to always be, uh, always ensure that uh, our application performs well. Like for example, you have a piece of code and you implement some kind of concurrency or multi-threading, right? You can see, uh, you can add log statements and you can see how much time, few threads or few processes took to run, right? And you can do that locally in your application or you can, if you have those very complicated systems and have concurrency in place, you can see actually the behavior as well. You can even be that minute. Logging will help you even track all of that. Uh, it's quite interesting. Um, yeah, towards the end of the session, almost tools is kind of the last thing. Uh, because we are doing so much automation, there is so much cloud computing, orchestration, logging, monitoring. There are a lot of technologies out there uh, that help us take care of all of these DevOps sponsors, right? There's automation, customization around all of these things for developers, for companies. So we don't have to build our own, um, you know. Um, for logging, we have like a bunch of different things like Logly, Splunk, uh, Greylog. They take care of specific kinds of logging. Uh, and there are kind of applications for logging, like, like troubleshooting, audit trail, business intelligence might care about your logging as well. Challenges are data overload, like I said, right? Do I need nine charts or do I need like uh, three charts? Right? Storage management, like where is all this log information stored, right? Like, do you even care about it? History of all this information. You need to be very careful. Like, I only care about log from this year. I don't care about logs of my application from last year. And I need to make the decision and why, right? Would I make that decision? So you need to be informed. And security, right? Like, you know, make sure that all this history you have is not accessed by anybody else outside your uh, teams or application uh, teams. Uh, so this is around like logging, uh, tech stack, like I mentioned before, uh, DevOps is huge and this is not even a full list, uh, right? Like we care about metrics, we care about optimization, we care about efficiency, we care about uh, uh, automation, we care about customization, uh, we care about security, privacy, everything, uh, right? So like these are some of the examples of like uh, uh, all these technologies or tools or companies out there that provide these um, um, solutions out of the box, like programming languages like Bash or scripting, right? They can automate uh, some uh, um, some development for you. They can help solve manual processes. Java, Ruby, they have libraries or gems that can take care of some kind of automation or out of the box solutions for you. Monitoring, we may, I already mentioned, like automation databases, like these all systems or uh, tools um, provide like basic functionality, but they also like solve a lot of infrastructure and security uh, problems for developers, for engineering teams. So, you know, it really simplifies um, uh, the development process and really uh, helps engineers or companies push high quality uh, code faster and build better products and more secure products. So uh, like I said, like no discovery, containerization management, build and CI CD. There's so much that goes into DevOps. And um, as an engineer, like I can tell like all these things are something that we have always worked with. It can be like, okay, I worked with GitHub, not Bitbucket or not GitLab, something like that. But uh, versioning control is something that's very foundation, for example, right? So these are the things to definitely uh, know and understand. You might not directly work on some of these applications, but know that if you're at a company and you have a product that's live, uh, today or tomorrow, your company will move towards as you scale uh, with your application, your data, your product, your, everyone's moving towards these, these technologies and everyone's moving, already has DevOps in place. 
um, and then it's all about using the same tools or updating to something new uh, for various trade-offs and reasons. So these are some very common DevOps tech stacks, right? Like public and private clouds have like AWS, Azure, OpenStack, uh, I, IAC or infrastructure as code. There are these kind of technologies or tools available for automation orchestration. You can use Bash or Chef, CI series Jenkins, Bitbucket, uh, all sorts of other tools. Uh, again, this is not a full list. Okay, uh, monitoring and logging is Splunk, Prometheus, uh, Grafana, uh, Elasticsearch. Uh, there are data log many more, right? Like they might take care of all the logging needs or they might take care of very specific logging needs. So you need to understand, like why would I pick Splunk versus data log? I can use both, but like, uh, what does that mean, right? Like, uh, do I have logging for all my environments, QA dev, production or only for production, right? I can only switch it on for production, not for dev or QA. So those things you need to work and understand as an engineer and work with your DevOps teams on what that looks like and cost is something to always keep in mind. And so that's why a lot of engineering decisions, um, that's why this whole DevOps is the process of understanding these things as a collaboration between engineering or developers and DevOps teams to come together and make these trade-offs and this decisions for the product, for the company, for the teams. And this is the end of the session. Uh, again, this is foundational. Uh, DevOps is a huge field and it's like with all these new companies coming in, new tools coming in, it's like very dyn dynamic uh, and uh, Every engineer kind of deals with like some new tool technology coming in and they have to learn. So this is this is like way of life for us. Um, this is the end of the session. If you have any questions or comments, you can put in the chat or unmute. Uh, just few logistical things. Uh, we have more sessions coming in with the backend study group in November. Next month, we have a session of how to be a good backend engineer. We already plan sessions for... Um, Next year, Q1, the first session is Web Development 101, where we'll talk about front end, back end, different technologies, uh, and what does web development mean, the whole full stack. Uh, and then uh, I have two more sessions that I need to publish. One is on Ruby on Rails, another is BigQuery, Google BigQuery, that will be Q1 next year. So stay tuned for that. Um, and there are all sorts of resources uh, to engage with women who code and back end study group until you shared them in the Slack channel. So. I really appreciate you guys being here and hopefully uh, you learned something. And uh, if you have any questions or if you'd like to connect with me and Anjali, um, feel free to do that and spread the word. I'm gonna stop recording. Thank you everybody uh, for joining this meeting. We had a great 